Now, you're all welcome, and a special welcome to you, Don. We've already said that, but we want to underline that again. And uh, you are going to talk to us about to follow Jesus into the broken places in our world. And uh, we will be happy to listen to you. And I know you will also give us some time to reflect together and to maybe ask some questions to you. You're welcome. Tak som ja. That's as far as I can go. Uh, thank you very much. It is a delight to be with you. Um, uh, I'm just thrilled to be a part of this uh, Vinter Conference, and I'm uh, delighted to be with you during this next hour. Um, in Philippians chapter 2, uh, Paul uh, states a question, but really as a preposition. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ. <laughs> I think that's good for us to think of as a direct question to our lives. Do you have any encouragement from being united in Christ? You see, I think it's very often the simplest and most basic gifts of God that we forget most quickly. When I come to a conference like this, I think of our uh, midwinter conference in the US and the incredible explosion of care that takes place there pastors to pastors caring for each other, the credible explosion of fellowship and mutual support. Um, and I think there is this marvelous, um, marvelous encouragement that we have from being united in Christ. And I think it is a very good thing to access that to, for ourselves. And to remember again what a gift it is to be united in Christ and to be sisters and brothers in this fellowship and in this ministry. Today, I've been asked to uh, do a workshop on the question, following Jesus into the broken places of our world. And really, I'm talking about something that is at the core of our encouragement in Christ. And that is this amazing good news that the God of the universe has invited each of us and the people we serve to join him in the work that he is doing, the transformative work that he's doing in our very broken world. This is an amazing thing. If I look at myself in the mirror long enough, I cannot believe that God chose me to be a tool for his work in this world but he has indeed chosen us to follow him into the broken places of our world. Uh, again, my name is uh, Don Ingebretson. I've served in a vocational ministry in the Covenant Church in the US for 35 years. I was a uh, lead pastor of Covenant Churches for 20 years, just a little bit about myself so you have a context of who I am and where I'm coming from. Uh, then I was asked to be the, uh, we call it executive minister of the ordered ministry, which is care and credentialing of all of our pastors um, and all of our credentialed uh, ministers in the denomination. And then I've been serving as a vice president of the denomination now for a number of years. And I'm in transition again because I've been asked to uh, move into more uh, uh, focused on mission funding for our denomination. Um, I, as I mentioned before, I gave leadership to our National Pastors Conference now for the past 15 years, and I love what happens when God's servants get together and learn and grow and care for one another. I have this conviction that any time a group of uh, the servants of the church get together, and this is just my thought from my experience, uh, at least a third are in some significant pain. Do you think this might be true? At least a third are really struggling in their ministry, really having difficulty finding fruit in their work. At least a third are um, maybe having struggles at home, um, challenges with the leadership of their church. So I want to thank you for caring enough about your fellowship together to invest this time in each other. 
because your investment in each other is so important for the work of the gospel in your ministry context. So thank you for being willing to uh, invest in one another and invest in your shared ministry here in Sweden. Um, my heritage, which is not terribly important in one direction or the other, but it's, it's both Norwegian and Swedish. Uh, I was very close to my father, who was also a pastor, and had a lot of uh, interaction back and forth between Sweden and the United States. And because of that, uh, I'm very proud of the fact, I know this isn't a big deal, but it's a big deal to me, my father received the order or commander of the Polar Star from the King of Norway. You know, it's a public relations type deal, but I got a big kick out of it. And um, it's hanging in my living room. Now, my father's gone home to be with the Lord. And I looked on the back of the citation, and it says very clearly that when the person who received the, uh, the award dies, that it's supposed to be returned uh, to Sweden. Do they really mean that? So I'm hoping that all of you have read Dr. Martin Luther King and, and Gandhi, and you understand civil disobedience, and that none of you are going to turn me in <laughs> and, and tell the authorities here that I still have the, uh, the award, and um, I'll never get out of Sweden. I'll be in some prison for the rest of my life. Two words about this seminar. Uh, one is that I know that, uh, as Dave said this morning, that the context of ministry is very different here. And I'm really speaking out of my own context, and I hope there are things that are transferable for your ministry as well. I know that the context of ministry here is different because I saw your president, um, Lasse Svensson, this morning wearing red pants. You can wait a hundred years. You'll never see the president of the Covenant Church in America wearing red pants. It, it, just, it just will not happen. So I know there are differences in the context of ministry. I'm also very humbled. Um, you are listening to me in a second language. And I know that that's a challenge. Um, some of you, your, your English is so good, it's amazing. But but I'm humbled by the fact that you're willing to allow me to speak in my native tongue. So if, if I say things that aren't clear, uh, that don't make uh, a lot of sense, please uh, say, you know, help me, ask me to explain, and I'll, we'll try to, to unpack things a little bit. Again, um, we're uh, speaking about um, following Jesus into the broken places of our world. It's one of the four of the primary uh, uh, focuses of this conference, to follow. And we're talking about following Jesus. So can, can I ask um, uh, Bertolt, if you would stand and pray for this conference this, this time, and just very briefly ask God to connect the best of what I have to say with the best of what is in our hearts. I assume that much of what I will share will be not new to you, um, but I pray that there are connecting points that uh, fire God's work in your minds and hearts. I want to start with a story. Um, the Covenant Church, the Mission Covenant Church of Fresno, California, is, is, a, is a, in American terms, a fairly old church. It's over 100 years old. It was started by Swedish immigrants um, who moved uh, to California uh, well over a hundred years ago. 
when they built the church that currently stands, uh, that church was built in a middle class neighborhood and many of the Swedish immigrants lived in that neighborhood. But over the last 40, 30, 20 years, that neighborhood where Mission Covenant Church is located in Fresno, California, uh, has become um, an inner city neighborhood. It's become, uh, in the American context, a, a neighborhood in which many, many immigrants have moved into that neighborhood. Many of them immigrants, maybe the population is somewhere near 70% immigrant population now in that community. And um, most of them probably immigrants from Mexico coming to find work in, in the US. And many of the members of the church, the Mission Covenant Church in Fresno have moved to nicer communities, to more expensive communities, to more suburban communities, and many of them travel into the city you know, to come to their home church, Mission Covenant. Um, the church has been, uh, had been losing members for many, many years. Uh, it had been getting smaller and smaller. Um, uh, and it worked hard to grow as a church and to, to kind of bring people into the church, but it really had almost nothing to do with its community. Uh, it's very, very broken, very, very fractured community where the schools were struggling and many uh, immigrant children were failing in schools and all of the problems that go together with those issues, again, in the American context. Um, the church struggled so much that it, it, it actually called a vote as to whether or not to close. To, uh, to close up the church and for all the members to go to other churches, probably in the new places their members were living. Uh, but something happened in that meeting where they were going to vote whether or not to close the church. Uh, maybe a movement of the spirit, don't know. But they decided they'd give it one more try. Only something happened and they said this time, instead of trying to build up the church, <laughs> instead of trying to get stronger as a local church and to get more members and more people, if we're going to stay here, we're going to instead turn our focus outward. And we're going to give ourselves away as a church. Kind of a biblical process there, I mean, a biblical idea. We're going to give ourselves away to this community and focus on the needs in this community. Uh, what they did is one of the ministries they started um, out of that near-death experience was they started a ministry to um, uh, children in the community. You know, in the United States, we have an enormous uh, incarceration problem. We incarcerate, we imprison more percentage of our people than any other uh, you know, Western industrialized nation in the world. It's an enormous, enormous tragedy. And many of those, the vast majority of those in the United States context are people of color. Uh, it's the marginalized and the poor who end up in prison. And you know that in the United States, you can, they can predict how many prisons they need to build by the test store scores of children in the fourth and fifth grade. Because if kids are failing, forgive me, in the fourth and fifth grade, they're going, to, they're headed for trouble. I'm sorry. So one of the ministries they started was uh, preschool, I mean, was training, uh, was uh, tutoring for fourth and fifth grade kids. And something happened. It started to grow, it got stronger, and they ended up developing something called the Fresno Covenant Foundation. And when I visited the church a few years ago, the Fresno Covenant Foundation, out of this very small church, was ministering to 500 uh, grade school age children every week. And it was the elderly people in the church who were doing the tutoring. These were senior citizens. These were older folks who were tutoring young children. They also started work with preschool. And so they were doing preschool work with 200 children every week. And they had this set up so that they always worked with the parents of the children. So they were helping the parents negotiate 
of their children going to school in a different language, in a different culture, and helping their children, uh, parents learn to become good parents and, and advocate for their children. Uh, it was a miracle. It's enormous transformation uh, of what this church was doing in its community. Um, right across the street from uh, Fresno Covenant Church is Barney Elementary School one of those very struggling inner city schools with an enormous immigrant population. The pastor of the church, uh, his name was Rocky Cook at the time, um, went across the street and went into the principal's office and said, we're the church next door. And the principal said, very nice to meet you. And, the, and Rocky said, we'd like to work with some of the children in your church. And the principal of the school said, uh, we don't want your church around here. You can take your church somewhere else. We don't want any Christians in this school. Uh, Rocky Cook said, please, please, um, we have a program where we try to work with young boys and help them become young men of character. And we, is it possible that we could work with your five most difficult boys? <laughs> the behavioral difficulty children in your school. And the principal said, you want my five worst boys? You want the five worst boys? Can you take them right now? <laughs> when we visited the church a few years ago, we, we met Chris. Chris was one of those five worst boys. And every day after school, Chris would come and work with Pastor Rocky Cook and with other members of the church. And because those members of the church had decided to follow Jesus into the broken places of the world, they loved Chris and they taught him about being a young man of character, but they also taught him Christ. And uh, the really cool kind of end of the story at that point was that um, that year at the Sunday school Christmas play for Fresno Covenant Church, a young man named Chris, who had been one of the five worst boys at Barney Elementary School played Joseph in the Sunday School Christmas play. His grandmother was raising him, and his grandmother um, wanted to come to church just once to say thank you because she saw such a huge change in Chris. Well, she came a second time. She only wanted to come once, but she came a second time, and then she started attending regularly. And Chris and his grandmother were baptized together. Jesus said, I am among you as one who serves. One of the most critical statements in the scriptures is Mark 10, 45. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. My read on the New Testament is that central to the call of God to the church of Jesus Christ is to be a servant people to a broken world in Jesus' name. For at least a while, Mission Covenant Church in Fresno, California followed Jesus into the broken places of their community and God created wonderful fruit out of that ministry. Blessing children and blessing their parents and people finding their way to faith in Jesus Christ. My favorite uh, statement of Jesus is, you didn't choose me, but I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So there are two parts of this workshop that I want to share with you. The first part is I want to give just a brief case for um, following Jesus biblically. And I know that I'm going to be repeating stuff you know, but I hope there might be some new connections for you from the scriptures that I look at. But what is the biblical case for following Jesus into the broken places of our world? And then the second part of the workshop is kind of where my heart really gets interested, and that is, uh, how do you lead your congregation into following Jesus into the broken places of your community, of your world? And I think this is a very significant challenge. And I'll talk more about that challenge as we get into it. Um, my style is kind of narrative. I'm more of a preacher than a teacher. Uh, there's going to be some chances for discussion but I'm also going to be talking a lot, so I hope that there are some connections here. 
So first of all, the biblical mandate to follow Jesus into the broken places of the world. It's not my understanding that following Jesus into the broken places of our world uh, is the totality of Christian discipleship. Not at all. Um, because um, one of the because Jesus following Jesus encompasses every aspect of life. Because following Jesus encompasses every aspect of the human condition, um, it can be enormously complex to explain to people what it means to follow Jesus. Because on the one hand, following Jesus is as simple as a relationship. Jesus says, come unto me. Can't have anything more simple than that. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. It's a relationship. It's an actual relationship between the living Lord and and us individually and our congregations. And so it's as simple as that relationship, but on the other hand, it's as complex as everything there is in life. So is government and politics a part of what it means to follow Jesus Christ? Is it? At least one person thinks so, okay. Um, is learning and education and growth a part of what it means to follow Christ? Is rest a part of what it means to follow Christ? Now, you're pastors. You don't rest very much. You all disobey the Sabbath, right? You work too much. You don't rest enough. Let me ask you again. Is rest a part of what it means to follow Jesus Christ? Thank you. Is recreation a part of following Jesus Christ? Every part of our lives, in all of its amazing complexity, Obviously, is relationships in our families, with our children, with our spouses, with our friends. Everything is a part. And so because Christian by faith, by definition, really is relationship and not simply ideology, following Jesus encompasses every part of our lives. But what I want to say, and here's my contention, that following Jesus into the broken places of our lives doesn't encompass the totality of following Jesus, but it is absolutely central. You cannot read the Old and New Testament without coming to this enormous burden that the church has this task given to it by God to follow Jesus into the places that are most broken. Eugene Peterson, we've just celebrated Christmas, um, all of us uh, in the church here, and of course the secular celebration of Christmas. And uh, it is this story that the God of the universe enters in to become human flesh. And I love Eugene Peterson's uh, language of this in the message. He says, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And it's a very broken neighborhood, enormously broken neighborhood. Uh, Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Uh, lost uh, connotes a, a, a definite state of brokenness. Uh, things are not the way they were supposed to be. And then, to me, very, very important, uh, Luke, uh, Mac, Mark chapter 4, where Jesus gives his mission statement for his mission in the world. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Five categories in Jesus' mission statement, his personal mission statement. Every category speaks specifically about some profound area of human brokenness. Our former president, Glenn Palmberg, has a wonderful uh, read on Matthew uh, chapter 3, the baptism of Jesus. Uh, where Jesus comes to John to be baptized in the Jordan River. And he talks about the fact that why didn't Jesus get baptized? 
We are told in Hebrews that he was in all ways tempted with us, yet without sin. So his need to be baptized, our baptism was all about the washing of, from sin to newness of life. So why does Jesus enter into the waters of baptism other than to enter and fully identify with the brokenness of human beings? So that when he went to the cross, he could carry the brokenness of human beings upon himself. And so our president had this wonderful phrase. He said, Jesus entered into the muddy waters of baptism. The waters of baptism that connote all of the brokenness and, and sadness and tragedy and hurt and woundedness and uh, the transference of pain that is about our existence as human beings. Another image that I really love about this from scripture is a friend of mine uh, refers to uh, Amos 5.21 where the psalmist tells us, and the, the prophet tells us that God hates our solemn feasts and assemblies. Uh, but let justice roll down like a river and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. That river of justice uh, God's compassion for the marginalized, for the oppressed, for the broken. God's compassion for the fact that this world is not the way it should be and that we are called to be a part of God's work in the world to make things right, both with compassion and mercy and caring about justice. He said, that river of justice, God's compassion for the poor and the oppressed, God's call for us to act and be advocates he said, that river of justice runs throughout all of scriptures. You simply find it everywhere, and then here's what it will preach. So this is the statement that will preach. Do you know what I mean by that? This is a communication tool. He said, you can't open the Bible anywhere without getting your fingers wet. Because it's everywhere. I didn't uh, do this because it would take too long, but uh, in pre preparing for this, I skimmed my way through the Gospel of Luke, just kind of reminding myself of Jesus' trajectory and where we would have to follow Jesus if we followed where he went. Every chapter, Jesus entering into the life, into the lives of the brokenness of human beings. Every chapter, every place. Jesus is walking into brokenness. And I want to remind all of you that this brokenness obviously is oppression and, and it's marginalization. And it's all of the things that are pushed aside by cultures that are doing well and uh, the protection of ourselves against those that might take what we have or who might threaten our safety. Um, but it also very much is the alienation from God that people experience personally. And so it is both the issue of being good news, like the Covenant Church in Fresno was being good news to its immigrant population. But it's also what Dave was talking about this morning of sharing good news. This marvelous good news that uh, I can find new life in Christ. One more illustration. Um, In 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17, uh, the Apostle Paul gives us this marvelous um, illustration, uh, the institution of communion, of the Lord's Supper. And it says that the Lord took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples. And Henry Nouwen has this wonderful little piece where he says that Jesus calls us to be broken bread for a broken world. And that we need to experience those four movements in our life. That we need to be taken by the power of a God who loves the world so much that he calls us. That we need to be blessed. In other words, we need to receive the blessing that we are chosen children of God. And that out of that enormous blessing that then we can be broken. And it's fascinating that our brokenness 
is that the closer we get to Jesus, the more we understand how broken we are. And then you see it's out of our brokenness ourselves that we begin to have a heart and a compassion for the brokenness in the world around us and we are given. So we are taken, we are blessed, we are broken, and we are given. To follow Jesus into the broken places of our world um, is central to what it means to follow Jesus. Um, this is the call of Christ, and it's central to the call of the church. Uh, Dave Olson mentioned N.T. Wright this morning. I like his phrase for this. He said, as Jesus to Israel, so the church to the world. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost in Israel. He came to heal the, the sick and to, and to care for everyone who came across his path at the point of their need. And in the same way, the church is called to the world. So that's a very, very short kind of scattershot picture of a biblical call. But if we took time this morning, we could just find that everywhere in scripture. What I want you to do for a minute is just uh, like two on two or two, three, at a, three at a time. I want you to think for a minute about what are the broken places a in the world. Let's just talk about what are the broken places. But then specifically, what are the broken places right where your church is right now? And I'm only going to give you about three or four minutes. So let's take a minute to talk about what are the broken places in the world and what are the broken places where you serve? Okay, please talk to each other. Okay, we're gonna pull back together. Can, can, can a few of you share something that stood out as something that captured your attention or captured your heart? What are some of the broken places? And I'm gonna ask specifically in Sweden, in your community. What? We are too 
Okay. Exactly. It's the, the, the right and creative people, the people living in our digital world left behind. Great, thank you. Another one? Can you talk about the environment? Okay. Yes. Really critical thing. If the church doesn't talk, every church has people who are abused in their church. Every church. If the church doesn't talk about that issue, people won't come for help. Okay, here. Yeah, uh, we said here that uh, all the very essence areas. Yes. My um, the domestic violence issue is interesting. We think of domestic violence being in lower socioeconomic places, but there's domestic violence in very wealthy places. Uh, people are tied into abuse by, by privilege and power. And uh, so it's very true. I want to argue that it's very paradoxical that um, some of the places that look the least broken are the most broken. Is this true? And yet I want to also say that the Bible has a profound preference for caring for the poor. So we need to keep those two in tension. Both are, both are important. Is there any others? Well, part of it is actually making conversations, and some people are doing that very, very well, simply uh, meeting people as human beings and, and being in dialogue. So, over back there. I think uh, we're very people, very broken. I'm also broken. Yes. You know, one thing I'm, I, I, I'm going to, let's, we'll go from there because that's really what I want to talk about is leading your congregation into the broken places in your community. And I will not answer every question because it's a huge topic, um, but we'll go from there. One, one, of the, one of the images that I like very much is a, a man named Henry Blackaby wrote a book in the United States called Experiencing God. Has anybody heard of that? Um, he had a very, very simple idea for the local church when it comes to following Jesus into the broken places in our communities. He said, spend time together, learn your community well, and look for where Jesus is already at work and join Jesus in what he's doing. It's a marvelous image, you know, that we don't bring Jesus for the first time into any place. Jesus is everywhere already. And if we're looking for the places where Jesus is already at work and join Jesus in what he's doing, we can see some marvelous things happening. So the call is found everywhere in Scripture. But just because it's found everywhere in Scripture, I spent some time on it because it can be missed. I can tell you that the evangelical church in the United States for almost 50, 60 years, almost entirely missed the message of God to follow Jesus into the broken places of our world. In fact, we had a movement called dispensationalism in the United States that was focused on writing out the parts of scripture that had to do with following Jesus into the broken places of our world. 
So that brings us to the second part of what I want to share, and that is how to lead your church into following Jesus into the broken places. My particular concern in this workshop is not just for you personally following Christ, but for your congregations. And so there's a huge paradox here. On the one hand, ever since the church was formed at Pentecost, the church has had an amazing faithful record of following Jesus into the broken places of our world. And we can celebrate all the way up to the present day so many marvelous examples of where people are following Jesus into the broken places of our world. The first three centuries of the church, the church grew exponentially throughout the Mediterranean basin. And we are told that primary among the reasons that the church grew, besides the power of the message itself, was the fact that the church was the one place where people cared for the foundlings. The foundlings were the children that people would put on the curb to die because they were not wanted. And the church would actually take those children and care for them. The church was the place that um, cared for the sick, especially during the plague. It was the Christians who would stay and nurse people even at the chance of their own death. Uh, the church was the place where slaves were welcome and where there was this, uh, this, this leveling across society. And it was this profound witness of the church to care to follow Jesus in the broken places that actually grew the church. And then Constantine came, and then we've been in trouble ever since. Um, so on the one hand, you have this enormous joyful record of the church being faithful. Do we not? But the other side of the paradox is that as a whole, if you look at the church of Jesus Christ in the world today, the picture is not always so good for following Jesus into the broken places of our world. Uh, right now I'm reading a brand new um, biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and it's just, a, it's just chilling to read about how the German church followed Hitler into the death camps. I mean, literally followed him. And there was so little resistance. And, and they, they basically celebrated German triumphalism, Nazi triumphalism, I should say, and, and, and walked away from the brokenness of the world into this triumphal future. Um, So here's my question. For the church today, and I'm thinking of your local congregation, is it an easy thing for the good and kind and marvelous people who come to your church, is it an easy thing, is it a natural thing for them to follow Jesus into that immigrant community that you were talking about a few minutes ago? Is it a natural thing for them to deal with issues of domestic violence? Is it a natural thing for them to follow, to even share their faith with their friends and neighbors? Is it a natural thing for people to follow Jesus into the broken places of our world? Uh, my contention is that it is not. <laughs> and the number one example that I have is myself. It's not natural for me. Uh, my tendency is to get really busy with my work in the church and get, get completely consumed by my call as a pastor and a church leader and to not follow Jesus into the broken places of the world. Uh, recently, an evangelical professor um, wrote a book primarily aimed at college students. And he, did a, he had one chapter on the church. It was, a, it was a book about Christian faith. And he had one chapter on the church. And his one chapter on the church irritated me just no end. And it wasn't because I disagreed with what he said. It's that I disagreed with the way he said it. So basically what he said was, if only, if only the church in America um, profoundly uh, created uh, authentic relationships between people based on the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. If only there wasn't this false community where we say hi to each other on Sunday morning, but we never really share our brokenness with each other. If only there was real community in the church, then the church would be wonderful and we'd want to go there and we'd want to bring our friends. And if only the church 
uh, ministered authentically to the poor, if only the church cared about uh, people in their broken places like it ought to, then you would want to go to church and you'd want to bring your friends to church and it would be a wonderful thing. Now his critique of the church is very accurate. <laughs> what bugged me is that he said, if only they do that as if it's a simple thing to do. And my conclusion was this guy's been a professor all his life, he's never been a pastor. He's never been a servant of the church. Because if you're a servant of the church, you know that leading your people into following Jesus into the broken places of our world is enormously challenging. Be encouraged, sisters and brothers, today. Your job is difficult. If you care about your church impacting your community, your job is really challenging. And I'm hoping I might give you a few clues this morning as to how, to how to address that in your local congregation. I think that your missional leadership task is profoundly difficult. I also think it's the most exciting opportunity and the most wonderful possibility that ever exists in the world to lead your people into following Jesus into the broken places of our world. So with the time we have left, I want to talk about that. And I'm going to give you a big picture that's very simple. Um, it's very simple, but before I give you this big picture of how to lead your people into following Jesus in the broken places of our world, I want to give you a theological assumption that undergirds it for me. It's very important. And the theological assumption that, un that undergirds this big picture as to how to lead your people into following Jesus into the broken places is that all of our obedience to Jesus is also our formation in Jesus. Let me say that again. All of our obedience to Jesus, to, to do what Jesus called us to do, is also the way in which we learn to look and behave and act like Jesus. Um, so we obey Jesus because he's Lord, correct? Jesus is Lord, and if he calls us um, to uh, clothe the naked and to feed the hungry and to visit those in prison, uh, then we are to do that because he said to do it, right? Is that, is that correct? But I also want to say that we enter into the disciplines of following Jesus in serving, in giving, in caring, because the disciplines of serving Jesus are the ways in which we allow the Holy Spirit into our lives so that the Holy Spirit can form us into people who look like Jesus and who act like Jesus. Um, I need to learn the practice, the disciplines of following Jesus into the broken places so that I become a person who has the capacity to follow Jesus into the broken places. Um, the reason I love Acts 29, do you know Acts 29? You all know that. You take a group of young people at the most formative stage of their life and you put them into an intentional discipleship program where they learn to minister to the poor, they learn to share their faith, they learn to talk with each other across cultures, and they develop the disciplines that then can determine the trajectory of their life for the rest of their life. Because you see, by doing the ministry, they're growing capacity for ministry. We need desperately to be changed. I loved yesterday's message about the gaps. About the fact that we start recognizing how far we fall short of what Jesus calls us to do. But we meet in the gaps. We share our brokenness in the gaps. So that out of that place, Jesus can form us into people who have a greater capacity to serve him and to be in his world. So, for instance, very small thing. I serve in our church's homeless shelter on a, as regular a basis as I can. Well, I do that because Jesus calls me to that ministry. But I don't just do it because Jesus calls me to that ministry. I do it because I need to grow 
as a person who has a heart for that particular kind of brokenness. You know, in the United States, we have very poor health care, and we have extremely poor mental health care. And so in the United States, people who should be under mental health care are on the streets. We have these enormous homeless populations of people, most of whom deal with things like schizophrenia and, and other kinds of very, very tragic mental illnesses, and they're on the streets. They are wonderful people. And you don't know that until you spend time with them and talk with them and share with them and, 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 and learn about their lives. But you see, for me, and I spend time with them because I need to grow. The discipline of blocking off a Friday afternoon and leaving work and going there is much more important for me than it is for them. Because it is a discipline through which Jesus has a chance to change me and grow me and grow my capacity for ministry. So, I'm not just saying to the people in my church, you have to do this, Jesus told you to do it. But I'm saying, follow me and practice these things so together we can learn to look and act like Jesus. So here's the big picture template. It comes from Dallas Willard. I uh, really like Dallas Willard and his teachings. Um, I was privileged to have him for a two-week intensive class. And this is a very simple thing he says. It's so simple. He says, if you want your people to be active in following Jesus into the broken places of your community, here's what he said. Ground your people in grace and lead your people into doing. Now, ground your people, does that translate into Swedish? What I mean by ground your people in grace is make the unlimited, amazing, counterintuitive, countercultural, free gift of God's love in Jesus Christ the foundation of all of your ministry and work. Ground your people in grace and lead your people into doing. So first of all, I want to talk about grounding your people in your congregation in grace. Sisters and brothers, in order to call people to serve the good news by following Jesus into the broken places in your community, in order to call people to serve the good news in the world, it must be good news that motivates them into that service. Now, I know this is obvious, but I don't see it happening very much. Um, when it comes to calling people into the difficult task that is not natural to them to follow Jesus into broken places, motivation matters. It matters how we motivate people into following Jesus. So how we call people out of what motivation is as important as what we call them to. When it comes to calling people to follow Jesus into the broken places, it's really challenging to see that the motivation is grace. So it's hard enough. If you want people to serve on your diaconate in your church, or if you want people to clean up the church basement, if you want people to give more money in the offering plate, it's hard to use grace as a motivation. It's so much easier to say, if you love Jesus, you ought to do this. You must not love Jesus very much. If you loved him more, you would do this. You should do this. Well, how much more with following Jesus into the broken places? The broken places so often are justice issues. It's about the enormous differential of power and wealth in our world. It's about deep pain in human beings' lives. When we talk about following Jesus, it is so easy to lapse into law and guilt as a motivation for calling our people to follow Jesus. Am I, am I making some sense here? It's really difficult that the motivation that we use for calling people is the motivation of God's amazing grace. Um, when we are seeking to lead people into the counterintuitively, potentially uncomfortable, and sometimes dangerous task of following Jesus into the broken places, 
um, it's very difficult that we can think carefully about what we are using to motivate people. So here's what Dallas Wolder is saying. If you're going to transform your church so that the culture of your church is a culture that is about following Jesus into broken places, then it's really critical that it's Jesus' unconditional love that allows me to go into those places. So here's some things. It's Jesus' unconditional love that empowers me to do the scary and sacrificial things. It's the fact that I'm already forgiven and chosen as a child of the king that sets me free to live for something other than my own self-interest. It's that I don't serve and follow Jesus into broken places so that Jesus will love me, but because he already loves me more than I could ever imagine. I love it when Paul tells us in, the, in his letter to Titus, he says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. We knew that, didn't we? We knew that salvation is from grace, right? That's foundational to the whole heritage we all share. That, that salvation comes from grace. But then Paul goes on to say, he says, that grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Real interesting. Paul doesn't say it's, it's law or Jesus' teaching or good theology that teaches us to say yes to following Jesus. It's actually God's grace. It's releasing people through God's love rather than coercing people through the great need. Do you, you see the difference? Um, the reason that grounding your people in grace in terms of getting them to follow Jesus into the broken places of our world is so important is that you're not just trying to start a program. You're not just trying to fix some problem in your community. You're not just trying to get something started, but you're actually trying to create people who have the capacity to change the world. You're trying to create a capacity in the lives of your people. We believe in the work of the Holy Spirit. We believe that if people enter into the disciplines of obedience, that the Holy Spirit will be faithful to change us from the inside out and grow within us the capacity to serve. In America, we have this problem. We think that what we always need in the church is more money. That if we only got some millionaire to give us millions of dollars, we could do God's work. Money is worthless if you don't have transformed people. It's people who are growing in their capacity to spend time with immigrant families, to learn about domestic violence so that they can actually be a resource to people who are struggling and in pain. It's people who are growing in their capacity to follow Jesus in the broken places of the world. And those people need to grow into people who can follow Jesus and you grow people through grace. So I have a, I have a, a, a warning, and a, just by the way, I'm convinced that grace, this is really silly, but grace takes lots of work. It is not our default method of motivating people. Our default method of motivating people is guilt and law and shame, and you know, you should and you must and you, you know. It takes a lot of work to build the foundation of the motivation of the church into a foundation of God's enormous grace. That actually what you're doing is not telling people what they have to do, but giving them an invitation into what God has created the possibility for them to do. Uh, grace is never a shortcut. It's always the long way around. So I have a warning about this thing of uh, grounding your people in grace. My goodness. Okay, I have a warning and a, and a um, I'll just give you the warning. <laughs> I apologize, I'm talking way too long here. 
in order to ground your people in grace, you have to be very aware of your own motivation for ministry. Uh, Lloyd Ogilvie said this about 30 years ago. I've never forgotten it. He said, whatever motivates you, you will communicate to your people. Whatever is motivating you for your ministry, you will communicate to your people. So if your foundational motivation is a sense of inadequacy, <laughs> that you really wish you were brighter or smarter or faster or quicker or more holy or a better person, and you're trying desperately to be good enough, then you're going to communicate telling your people that they have to try harder to be better in order to be loved by God. If what motivates you is a profound sense of sadness for the ways you failed, and you want to do well this time so you can atone for how badly you've done in the past, I can promise you that's what you're going to communicate to your people. I don't care how many times you use the word grace. I don't care how many times you say grace. You will motivate people by whatever motivates you. If, if, if you have this constant feeling that your cup is half empty, that the cup of what, of what would bless your life is always not what it should be, and that you're desperately trying to fill your cup by, by being successful or being liked or being loved, then you're going to communicate to your people that they need to try to fill their own cup too. But if you've done some real work to receive this blessing from God of his unconditional love for you, if you've allowed him to say, you are my daughter, I love you so much, I'm so proud of you, if you listen to God when he says, you're my son, I love you so much, I'm so proud of you, and if you minister out of the fullness of God's love for you, then you can invite people into this adventure. You can invite people into this enormous adventure of following Jesus into the broken places of the world. It's really about whether or not you're willing to hear that you are a beloved child of God. So you ground your people in grace. To me, if you don't think that through, the rest of it doesn't work. Because you just end up building a performance cycle where everyone tries to be good enough. And when they can't be good enough and they can't be faithful enough, they try to pretend that they're faithful enough. And we build the hypocrisy into the church that kills the church. Instead of the church being a place of brokenness where we all are starting in the gaps where we know we can't and then we're allowing Jesus to help us grow, uh, we end up with a place that actually doesn't have love to share with the people we're going to love because we haven't really learned that ourselves. So Dallas Willard says, ground them in grace and then lead them into doing. So I had a couple uh, in the church I served in Easton, Connecticut. Easton is actually a wealthy little suburb in Connecticut. Fairfield County, Connecticut is the, um, when I lived there, they told me that if you counted the corporate headquarters, it was the sixth wealthiest nation in the world. This is one county in Connecticut. But we also have Bridgeport right next door. Bridgeport was the first city in the United States that declared bankruptcy. Incredibly poor, incredibly broken. Now obviously, as you said, stated earlier, Easton was broken too in its own very profound way. Um, but, um, I became a part of ministry in Bridgeport and we did lots of work back and forth, but there was a couple in that church named Bob and Ann Lindquist. Following Jesus into the broken place of, of the world was their entire life. I learned so much from them. I am so indebted to them. They taught me so much about following Jesus and it's important in the center of our gospel life together. But I don't know very many Bob and Ann Lindquists in churches. Most of the scared, comfortable, and overbooked people that are in our churches 
need to be led into doing. We need to find creative ways to give opportunities for our people to follow Jesus into the broken places of our world. You need to take me by the hand and say, Don, on Saturday, we're going to be meeting with this immigrant group and we're going to be talking about their challenges and we're simply going to be doing some, some work with the children this Saturday. And Don, we'd like you to come with us and we'd like you to be a part of that too. Ground your people in grace and lead them in doing. As I said earlier, the formational part of where we grow our capacity is in actual acts of obedience that are also acts of discipleship and formation. So in the American context, actual doing are things like working in a soup kitchen, tutoring children, working with children of immigrants, at-risk teens, uh, leading an alpha course, uh, advocating for fair prison terms, uh, intentional relationships with neighbors. You could go on and on. And you do all of those things in Sweden as well. You can do all those things in Sweden. All of those things are things that we need to create opportunities for people to get engaged. Most of the people in your church need to be given opportunities and apprenticed into following Jesus. The other thing is that's really important is um, you need to take a long-term approach. You need to decide that it's at the heart of your church to ground your people in grace and lead them in doing because it takes a long time. People who study how groups change say that in any given group, only 2.5% of the people are, are innovators. So you only have a couple of people in your congregation who can look at a problem and say, I think I know how we might do something about that. I think we, there might be a way to love those people in a way we haven't thought about loving them before. But only 13% of the people in your congregation are actually early adapters. You know, early adapters were the first people who bought an iPhone. You know, the, when, when it first came out, the first people who bought one were early adapters. So please, when you're thinking about leading your church into following Jesus, don't be afraid to work with just a few people. Don't wait for the whole congregation to get on board. Because if you work with a few, you can grow a culture that the rest can live into. Uh, sociologists tell us that the next is the middle adapters. It's about 30, 35% of any given group. You need a long-term strategy to invite and welcome and apprentice the people who are in the middle to begin engaged in the business of following Jesus into the broken places of the world. A couple of other things real quick. Create a create a, a crisis of awareness. You know, uh, you're intensely aware of the immigrant situation. How many people in your church are intensely aware of that? Okay. Intentionally. Yes. And okay. That's wonderful. Yeah. They didn't have an awareness. Thank you. Create a crisis of awareness. You need to preach the river that runs all the way through scripture. And you need to help people see with new eyes their own communities. We actually had a, a guy who was focused on the ministry in the cities in, 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 in the states for many years. His name was Ray Bakke. And Ray Bakke used to talk about exegeting your community. Do a very careful sociological study of the community in which your church lives. Study it carefully. Find out where the money flows. Find out where the power is. 
Find out where the places of marginalization are. You'll learn amazing things about your community. And then you create a crisis of awareness by helping people see with new eyes the brokenness all around them. Um, we are at the end of our time, and I didn't finish my workshop. I apologize for that. But I'm around all week, and I'm glad to share. We'll just take a couple minutes. Are there some questions or some comments or some things that you'd like to, to raise up at the end here? I think that learning about what Christ is doing in other cultures and in other contexts is extremely helpful. Yeah. The biggest problem is that in the US, we watched our missionaries for generations yeah. following Jesus into broken places, and we thought that was wonderful, but that we need to do it in our churches in the States. But it's happening. It's growing. It's marvelous. There are really good things happening. Other questions or comments? You know, my, my experience with that church is secondhand. I visited there and I've talked to the pastor, but I don't know it extremely well. I think that church is actually still a fairly small church and still fairly struggling. It still is focused on ministry outside itself. Good things are happening, but it's not like this great success story. It's still a challenge. I appreciate you raising that because people are terrified. People are scared to death of following Jesus into the broken places of the world. We are, we are enormously comfort seeking <laughs> creatures and we are terrified. And that's why, that's why I talk so much about grace. Because if it's a gracious invitation, as opposed to you're really a bad person if you don't do this, we, we give people room to grow and give people room to move into something different. You know, the, 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 the best thing is that Jesus created us for this. You know, Ephesians, for you are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which were created beforehand for you to do. You know, it's what we're made for. We're trying to help people live into their, into their heritage. Eva? I think the one of the most important things you can do is get a team in your church that actually people who have a heart for this so that you have a group of champions who are meeting once a month or whatever to, to, to think about a long-term strategy of doing exactly those things. If you're the pastor and you're doing this all by yourself, it's going to be really difficult. But if you can get a group of people who have a passion for this, to be dreaming and then create, again, creating opportunities for people to, again, lead people into doing, and then opportunities to reflect and grow. All of those things are good. I don't have a, but, but you, need, you, you need to build a structure underneath following Jesus into the broken places. And that's one of the places that is very challenging. 
but, it, but it's really important. The, the other thing is, I can tell you this, as a pastor, you have to model this behavior as a leader in the church. If you're not participating in ministry in your community, don't expect anyone else to. And I can give you an example of this from my own life. I, I can promise you I am not, do not have the gift of evangelism. I profoundly wish I did, I profoundly do not. But when I was a pastor um, in Farmington Hills, Michigan, the last church that I served, I just did something very simple. And it's very self-serving, so you, you've got to forgive me for this. We had a bunch of men in the church whose wives were dedicated believers who just wanted nothing to do with the church. So what I did is I played golf with those guys. How's that for sacrificial ministry? <laughs> I just regularly took those guys out and played golf. And we had a chance to talk about spiritual things and it was marvelous. It was great. And you know, people in the church saw that I was doing this and I was modeling what I was asking people to do. If we're not willing, you know, there's a saying, Debbie Blue, my colleague says, you can't teach what you don't know and you can't lead where you won't go. So we need to find ways. And if we're struggling in doing these things, we need to find someone to help us. The most important, the most important thing a pastor or a leader in the church, the most important tool you have in your bag is that you can ask someone for help. You do not need to have all the gifts and all the ideas yourself. Find somebody who's, who's doing this and get them to lead you. So, anything else? What, the, what issue? You mean, you mean for me as, yeah. well, I think so. I think that within the context of our wonderful message on the gaps, where it's not simply talking about the places we're successful, but giving witness to where God is changing us, I think that that really makes a difference. Did I answer your question? Okay. Well, it is uh, five, five minutes after 12, but this was supposed to end at 12. I'm here all week. I'm really glad to talk. And I appreciate your patience, and uh, thank you so much for being here. I, I pray for you. Um, um, we were created to follow Jesus. And Jesus is profoundly committed all of the brokenness in this world. And it's the greatest privilege we have to just have a little part in following Jesus into this brokenness in this world. And it is the place where Jesus will feed us and grow us and show us more and more of himself. So God bless you in that journey. Amen. Thank you so much for your speech. It has given us hope, I think, and grace, and much love. So thank you.